Thank you all for being here. I'm Kim Todd with Global Ties Sacramento. I'm joined with my colleague Alana Crandall at Global Ties San Francisco. We are very honored to be hosting this event, a community conversation with the International Labor Organization. Um, just a shout out to Carlton, um, who connected us with our guest speaker, Kevin Cassidy. Um, like I promised, I'm, I'll run through the technical aspects here. Um, you guys are all familiar with Zoom. We're gonna ask everyone stay muted uh, through the duration of our uh, conversation with Kevin. There will be time uh, later on for some open Q&A. So at that point, um, feel free to ask any questions using the chat box, or uh, you can raise your hand during the open Q&A and we will call on you to unmute yourself and then ask the question. That might be it for our technical reminders. I'm gonna hand it over to Alana now. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, Kim. Hello everyone, nice to see you all. My name is Alana Crandall and I am from Global Ties San Francisco. And my colleague that you were seeing just now is Kim Todd from Global Ties Sacramento. We both lead international programs and events at our respective offices under the umbrella of World Trade Center Northern California. We work in citizen diplomacy and partner with Global Ties US to implement the US Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program, or IVLP, in our geographic regions all in an effort to foster mutual understanding between people of the United States and other nations. Thank you for joining us today for Meet the International Labor Organization, a community conversation. This session will serve as an introduction to the International Labor Organization, otherwise known as the ILO, which is the United Nations Agency for the World of Work. It will address the ILO's work both in general and at the local level, touch on its 102 year history, reflect on its goals and highlight some of its focus areas. The ILO is devoted to promoting social justice and internationally recognized human and labor rights, pursuing its founding mission that social justice is essential to universal and lasting peace. Today, our distinguished guest is Mr. Kevin Cassidy, the director and representative to the Bretton Woods and multilateral organizations for the International Labor Organization Office for the United States. Mr. Cassidy has nearly 40 years of international development experience, serving in many roles at the ILO. He holds a Master of International Affairs with a concentration in economic and political development from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. It is a pleasure to have you here and quite truly an honor. So to get us started, I was wondering if you could just start off by telling us a little bit more about your work, what the ILO does and broadly, let's start there. Right. Well, uh, thank you to Global Ties uh, San Francisco and Global Ties Sacramento for inviting me. Um, ILO is really kind of one of the best uh, kept secrets in the UN system. We are a technical agency, um, but we are also the oldest multilateral organization. Um, I'll give uh, kudos to those who can name the other two institutions that were created before the ILO, although based on technologies, which are still a part of the technical system of the UN. Um, my organization and what I do in particular is to look at the issues in the world of work. And, this, and we say the world of work rather than employment, because we're not just looking at the developed world, we're looking at developing countries as well. And anybody who has traveled or done business overseas and, and gone to school or studied, um, you'll see that work uh, has many different forms. Uh, many years ago, there was a, a brilliant um, Indian economist who had said that the poor do not have jobs. They have um, oppor economic opportunities that they string together to create a livelihood. And I always thought that was a great contextualization of developing country uh, labor force. But it's now becoming true in developed countries as well with the advent of digital labor platforms and different classification of workers and different types of work uh, that are out there. Um, so the world of work is changing and the ILO's job, even though we are 102 years old, um, is to stay abreast of the developments and how do we ensure that the concept of social justice, uh, which basically is equal treatment under the law, um, is reflected in a way that respects the human rights. So the ILO is a human rights institution, and why is that so? So the ILO 
unique amongst the UN has a very unique structure, which is called the tripartitism. And this basically means that the governments and the workers and employers organizations representative of those countries sit down at the table, discuss these issues, charge the ILO to do the research, gather the statistics and to develop policy prescriptions. And then upon discussions, develop the framework for the international um, normative system in the world of work. So things like child labor laws, minimum age, um, issues such as uh, um, labor migration or domestic workers or uh, family responsibilities. Uh, all of these um, structures come out of the ILO. And I don't mean that in the sense of us bureaucrats sitting down and deciding what is good for the rest of the world, but it is the representatives of the various 187 countries with the workers and employers. So for the US, we work with the Department of Labor, we work with the Department of State, we work with USAID, we work with the US Trade Representative's Office, we work with AFL-CIO, SEIU, we work with the US Council for International Business, the Chamber of Commerce, and we bring all of those voices to bear on these issues. And my job is to communicate that knowledge, the knowledge products that we bring together, the comparative policy analysis that we do, and to share that with wider groups through uh, issue-oriented groups such as yourselves, could be government, could be businesses. But the idea is, what is the world looking like? What are the best policies? And how can we work together to create a level playing field so that everyone fairly shares in the, um, the sort of incomes and the wealth that is being generated? Yeah, the, the multi-stakeholder approach, I can assume there are some difficulties with that from time to time, but I'd like to hear what are some of the successes and challenges of bringing so many different people and organizations to the table? Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 I look at it as a community uh, approach. So for example, if anyone out there, you know, I mean, of course, COVID time has really changed a lot of our personal interactions. Um, but, you know, if you get together with your friends and you decide, well, where are we going to go eat tonight, right? I mean, 10 people will have 10 different ideas. And how do you uh, discuss that? How do you compromise? Um, it's the same thing uh, in business. You know, what investments do we make in order to create greater profits or returns on an investment? How do we deliver to market better products? Uh, if you're an individual with a family, you know, what do I need to do to upskill myself to, to have a better income so that I can afford to have maybe a home? Uh, to send my children to school. So having the voices of the people in the real economy, so just having the governments is not enough. You have to have those people who are investing their money to, you know, to put uh, these ideas into action through a business, as well as having the talented people who have the skill sets, the energy, the industry, and the productivity to make that a going concern. So by having both elements at the table, plus the government, ensures that what you have is a and I'll use this word uh, and I'll explain why a compromise, because we don't always get everything we want. And compromise is not a bad word. It's not a dirty word. It's not a weakness. Compromise is how we, as a species, as a country, as an international community of different interests, move forward together. So what we look at is not how we split up the existing pie, but how do we, through negotiation, through dialogue, through uh, statistics, through uh, research, have the best information possible to enlarge that pie so that we are able to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to move forward together. Because when you have inequalities, that's where the economic spills into the social sphere and then spills into the political sphere. And that's where the problems occur. So having that negotiation with this multiplicity of voices is really important. And I can give you some examples, but I'll just pause right there. Yes, we will definitely like to hear your examples, but for this part, I'd like to ask you about decent work. We hear this term and I, I feel like it needs some elaboration because it, it has a specific meaning. Could you please elaborate on what you mean by decent work? Yeah, um, you know, decent work is, um, I'll, I'll give you a little backstory very quickly, is that our former Director General, Juan Somavia, who was a Chilean diplomat, uh, and at the time, uh, he was working at the UN for what's called the Social Summit in Copenhagen. And he was inspired by a picture he saw in a magazine, which was about 1930s, United States. It was the sort of the height of the Depression. And he saw a man standing with a sandwich board that says, family man, uh, educated, willing to work, need a decent job. 
And he was so struck by that idea about having a decent job so that he could provide for his family. So in that, this idea of a decent job, not just a good job, right? Because you can have a job that pays well, but there are no benefits. You can have a job that may be exciting, but doesn't pay very well. You could have a job that has none of that, but you have to do something because you need to put food on the table and you can stand by while yourself or your family goes hungry. So the idea of decent work means that you are able to find a job that provides you with an opportunity to bring your skill sets to bear in a productive manner that is freely chosen that provides opportunity for advancement and security in that job, and that there are certain protections that you have, freedom from harassment, freedom from discrimination, freedom to exercise your skill sets in a way for an exchange or for that remuneration that is fair. So what does that mean? So decent work is a concept, and let's look at it as a house. So the roof is decent work, which provides protection for people. And when we talk about labor, we're really talking about people, people in the workplace. Um, it's not just an economic term, but it, we are really boiling it down to its essence. So the roof of the house is decent work. And what holds that up, the four pillars that hold that up, are, is dialogue. How do you have communication between the workers and employers to ensure that each other understand the constraints and opportunities to move forward? So if you have people sitting at the table who are demanding too much money, too many benefits, when the going concern cannot generate that, you have to understand and you work with them or you move on to another job. So having that dialogue in the workplace ensures that you have a harmonious and productive workplace that not only provides for the people who are running the company, but for those people who are trading their time, their industry, their talent uh, to, uh, to make that a going concern as well. Because we are investments. As a person who works for a company, you are the most important investment a company can make because it is because of your skill sets, your knowledge, your ideas, and your energy that you are then creating products and services that will be able to be sold. So you have to know that you have dialogue. The second pillar of this is called uh, um, employment, right? So this is the big general term. How do we have opportunities for employment? How do we find jobs? I mean, in the old days, it was through networks of contacts. It still exists in many ways, but now in a digital age, we're accessing work through platforms. Uh, sometimes because there are job advertisements, but other times through uh, labor plat digital platforms such as TaskRabbit or Upwork. So how are we creating jobs? How, not the ILO, but how does the economy create jobs? And you have all of the systems in place in order to create good jobs and what constitutes a good job. None of us want to be working someplace that is too hot, that may give us health problems. Nobody wants to see young children at work uh, which uh, robs them of their future and doesn't allow them to uh, develop uh, fully as human beings. No one wants to be in a business at a disadvantage because slave labor or forced labor is being used by a country or an industry which is lowering the price of that product and then floods the market and puts you out of business. So we want to see a leveling of the playing field. So dialogue and creation of good jobs and employment is very important for decent work. The third element of that is standards. Standards and norms. The ILO is a normative agency. We create what we call the rules of the road. It's not the ILO. It's the government, workers and employers that decide that we are going to talk about minimum wage or minimum age or conditions of work or what is it like in mining or what is it like for seafarers. We have a big convention, which is called the Maritime Labor Convention, which provides uh, the millions of seafarers and what are bringing 80% of all the goods from around the world to our marketplace today. So we have to make sure that we look for the, the protection of those workers. So this is the plumbing of the international system. When the ILO was created in 1919, uh, you know, the modern capitalist economy was one of many different competing economic uh, schemes. So with that, the ILO was front and center at the beginning of our current uh, capitalist system. So having those labor standards, having the plumbing that works to make sure that there is fairness, not only for the worker, but also for the employer. So these standards are important. They're internationally negotiated. They are ratified by a country. And once they are ratified by a country, there's an obligation for that country to create um, national legislation for that. I'll give you an example. Um, the Harkin Engel Protocol, Senator Harkin, who is no longer in office, and Elliot Engel came together to look at child labor. And child labor is rampant around the world. When we first started, we looked at 257 million children 
in work, sometimes in the worst forms of child labor. And with that, it was robbing those countries of the opportunity of their future workforce. Think about it. If you have children or brothers and sisters or nieces and nephews who are 9, 10, 11 years old, wouldn't we prefer them to be in school so that they can bring their skills and talents to bear so that they become very productive? developments of people in society, rather than having the children going off to work and that are selling, you know, goods on the street corner and, and grow up, uh, you know, having very limited options. Because an illiterate, innumerate child will be an illiterate, innumerate adult and will not be able to move that society forward. So having the rules of the road are very important, again, internationally negotiated. Um, so dialogue, um, what we call social dialogue, um, the employment and the negotiations. And then with that, we have social protection. Uh, again, in the States, uh, I'm from New York myself originally, but I've spent most of my time overseas. Uh, social protection is what we call social safety nets. So should we not have access to good nutritionist, uh, nutritional food? Um, we know in psychology that if children don't have the right nutrients when they're younger, they're not going to grow up strong. They won't fully develop their brain. Uh, we know that if people don't uh, have access to early education, that they, uh, they don't do as well in later in life. We know that you know, pre-K is very useful, and I think most of us out there would agree. Giving a child a head start is very, very important in life today because you can't just have an education for 23 years and then you know, with that work for the next 30 we are having to upskill and reskill ourselves. So looking at education and access to quality education is, is very important. Access to healthcare. Most people don't leave their jobs because they are, they are trapped in their job because they don't wanna leave behind the uh, health insurance that they have. So we have to look at how do we provide health insurance to everyone? Because if you don't have a healthy workforce, you will not have a productive workforce. So all of these fit in together in this sort of larger system of social safety networks Unemployment insurance is one, active labor market policies are another, transition from school to work, uh, having career guidance, work to work, uh, different jobs. Uh, you may be a truck driver, you lose your job to an automated vehicle. Can we reskill you and retrain you to be a logistics officer? And then when you transfer from work to pension, uh, to old age. I mean, most people today uh, don't realize that pensions will be basically gone. Uh, 401ks, um, you know, it's a different story. It's an investment instru instrument, but it's not a proper pension. So most people will not be able to afford to retire ever. So having those elements that create automatic stabilizers so that if something like COVID-19 struck, you don't fall into abject poverty. You have to sell the house at a, at a uh, fire sale rate that you don't have to move your children. So they are leaving their friends, leaving their network of contacts. So having that protection is really important. So social protection, social dialogue, economic, and when I say social, I mean people, this is, policy for people are the pillars that hold up decent work. That's fantastic. Thank you. One of my questions was going to be about the four pillars as well. So I appreciate you <laughs> jumping right in. A lot of people are very interested in the United Nations 2030 sustainable goals. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how the decent work agenda factors into that? Yeah, um, you know, constantly our thinking is updating and I'll, and I'll weave into that what the ILO has now on, in, in the advent of our centenary, which took place in 2019. Um, we had a future of work report, which developed what's called a human centered agenda for the future of work. Um, and I'll, I'll explain how decent work is a part of that and how the SDGs are, are a way to animate those issues. So. Uh, and I was a part of the team at the United Nations in New York who negotiated the uh, goal eight, um, which is on uh, decent uh, and productive work uh, for the, uh, for the uh, ILO in the United Nations. Um, when you have a good job, you are able to put food on the table. So you're addressing hunger you know, the, and poverty, these, these first two elements of the sustainable development goals. So having a good job is the most sustainable way out of poverty and the way to avoid hunger. So those are two very important elements. But also when you have a good job, it means also that you have opportunities and access to education, education being another important part. And as we look at the future of work, you know, we are moving uh, at a light speed now because of the way in which our economy is structured in, in the United States and also in Western Europe. There are many countries that are still uh, agricultural based. There are many countries that are manufacturing based. You know, the US went through that as well too. 
I mean, if we go back 200 years, there was uh, about 68% of people in the United States were working on farms. Today, there's only 2%. But other people, but the, in the United States, the, the structure of our economy has changed. So we have moved from a agrarian society to a manufacturing society to a knowledge economy to now what we call the innovation economy with technology. Um, technology has always changed work, uh, but it has in, been very important in order for us to move forward and to have a higher standard of living. That gives us access to healthcare, that gives us access to a more productive work life as well too. Um, when you start to look at global supply chains, again, this is something the ILO is very much invested in because we want to ensure that in your supply chains, especially in upstream activities, such as harvesting of cotton or the uh, collection of coca or or mining cobalt, you know, which goes into the batteries in your laptops, uh, the chocolate, which we love to eat, the cotton, which goes into the clothes that we wear and we buy. Um, uh, in many instances, uh, with the new model of global supply chains or global value chains, you have these international buyers that uh, task uh, local suppliers to do it all. So you have a vertical supply chain. But do we know that, for example, in chocolate, that child labor is rampant? Do we know that in cotton harvesting in many countries around the world, child labor and forced labor is there? So we have to ask ourselves, are we culpable in this? So what the sustainable development goals do is that it sets up this rather ambitious blueprint, which for me, and it's the reason that uh, the decent work is goal eight, because having a good job addresses every single one of those SDGs, women's empowerment, protection of the land, protection of the sea, partnerships, international regulations, all of these things that come together under the SDGs, which is an amazing document and really an ambitious plan for humanity, not just for the US, but a very important plan. Um, some people may say, well, what does climate change have to do with us? Well, you know, the patterns of weather are changing. So if other areas which were very productive in, in uh, producing food um, and they become arid, the rainfall drops, or there's too much rainfall, as we had seen last year in many uh, states across the United States, where waterlogged farmers had, had to write off their entire crops. Uh, COVID-19 showed that global supply chains were, were a bit uh, ill-designed because we couldn't have access to PPEs. So I think the sustainable development goals are really centered around us as a species, and we have to look at the, the global world, uh, the world around us, as well as the work that enables that to happen because the goods don't go from point A to point B without somebody working on it. You do not have goods and services without somebody working on that, whether it's in the production of that or the harvesting of the materials or the transportation or the selling of that good. People are central to all of that and work is the nexus between the economic and the social. Absolutely, and you, you touched on a point here that is on everybody's minds. Let's talk about the pandemic briefly. The pandemic has as we all know, significantly impacted workers, businesses, and industries of all types, and the global economy. What long-term impacts does the ILO think the pandemic will have on labor resources, standards, the way we do business moving forward? Has that impacted the future of work as it was envisioned before, for instance? Let's start there. Right. You know, I, I, uh, I have to be careful. I'm not a prognosticator. Uh, I like to work with the facts and figures we have. But I will uh, take a little bit of license and uh, bear with me and please formulate questions for this later. Look, I think COVID-19 has shown how frail our economy is. Who knew back in March? I mean, I remember March 17th, leaving my office in Washington, coming back up to my house in New York here and never returning for a whole year. I did go back once in a while, but my office was basically closed. How many people out there today have been working remotely and probably will continue to work remotely even if things get better? So businesses are making investment decisions in technologies. And we know that when technology is, you know, has a greater penetration in our economy, it has a displacement effect. So COVID-19 has changed us in a way that it has changed the way in which we conduct work. I'm speaking to you from my library here in my house on Staten Island, just outside of Manhattan in New York. And here I've got my lights, I have my video camera. Uh, this is a television studio. I am coming to you from my personal television studio and conducting business with you as I do with delegates and uh, government officials uh, all around the world every day. I started this morning with South Africa. I will end up uh, very late tonight talking to my friends in Indonesia. 
Um, so work has now changed, the, the basis of work. So what is the implication of that? If the office space and those who may be in real estate know this very well, that the real estate market, certainly in Washington has not gone down and there's a lot of construction going on right now, but construction mostly in residencies because commercial markets have had real big problems and the vacancy rates are extraordinarily high. So if you have commercial real estate that is going unused because people are realizing my workforce can all be remote and I don't have to pay for an office downtown because it's closer to where everybody is and I can use technology to do business. What happens to all of the restaurants? What happens to all of the shops, all of the pharmacies, all of the places that we used to go to when we would go to the office during the day and meet with people at night or having lunch here and there? So it has had an impact on the way in which the structure of nature, uh, the uh, work has been. It has also given us pause for thought on global supply chains. In the beginning, we couldn't get our masks. We couldn't get the, you know, these N90 masks for ourselves because everybody was running for it. I mean, uh, how many people out there went out and bought, you know, five big, uh, you know, packages of toilet paper from Costco so they would have enough in their home? So supply chains have changed. Uh, there was a story recently about. Uh, McDonald's and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, they couldn't get those little ketchup packages because people weren't going out to these fast food places to get ketchup. So the production had moved from individual packages for fast food um, sort of uh, um, markets to being, you know, doing these big sort of giant, you know, one liter bottle size ketchup for people who are at home. So the, the mode of production has shifted as well too. And also companies felt that they got caught short because they weren't able to access the, uh, the goods and services and the intermediary inputs, intermediary inputs that they need. For example, the automotive industry itself now is suffering because it doesn't have enough microchips. They are building on, I think the term is called hollow cars. They are you know, promoting these wonderful cars with all the sort of wonderful features and so, but you need that microchip that is, you know, that is embedded with a firmware that does a function, whether it is, you know, looking at 360 around your vehicle, or it is a proximity detector, or that you have, uh, you know, new uh, applications in your car that allow you to do car Apple Play or to use uh, GPS. Um, so it does impact upon what we do. But it also has shown that certain sectors are extraordinarily sensitive to this. So the restaurant industry has been absolutely decimated by this. Hospitality has been decimated by this by reasons you could imagine. You're not traveling, you're not going out for business dinners. All of those things have an impact and a rippling in effect. And governments have to respond to provide people with money. I do believe in income support because when somebody is given money, it goes right back into the economy. If somebody is given money because they're out of work, it's not to make people feel they can stay at home, but that goes back into telephone bills, it goes back into electric, into gas bills, into rent, into mortgages, car payments, so we don't lose everything, right? So that money that goes to people who need it go right back into the economy. So it generates the, uh, the uh, economic uh, uh, sort of energy that we need. But what it does do when they're starting to come back is that they're talking now about jobs and people can't, they can't, business people can't find somebody for say restaurants. Now, I'll be honest with you, if anybody, and I worked when I was going to college at restaurants as well and other odd jobs, I mean, $2.17 an hour plus tips, you really can't live on that. And people were making things work because as I said earlier, the poor don't have jobs, they have economic opportunities, they string together to create a livelihood. People were working three, four, five jobs on digital platforms just to make ends meet. And people had hoped that if I worked really, really hard, one day it would pay off and I'd, I'd have this wonderful opportunity for myself. But that dream never really came to fruition. And a lot of people don't want to go back to that. A lot of women are leaving the workforce because they realize that I'll go back to a job that maybe I'll get less benefits, but who is going to look after my children? Do I trust my children with people who may not have been vaccinated? Am I really sure that this is the right way to go? And spending time with our children sometimes can be really frustrating being in one place, but it is also a, a joy as a father myself, raising a child, being there for the child in the critical years, and today it's my grandchildren, and I haven't seen them in over a year. So we want to get back to that, but that does have an impact. So there's a cascading effect on all aspects of work, and we have to look at that and how do we skill people, upskill, reskill people in a lifelong cycle to ensure that we are well prepared for the innovative future of our economy. Reskilled, I think that's something that is also lost oftentimes with audiences that maybe aren't familiar with your work. 
and the reskilling of people and helping them get into if they lose their job, for instance, and helping them get into a new job rather than just um, seeking employment in the field they were originally in, perhaps manufacturing, something that's no longer a job opportunity in their area. ILO has over 50 years of experience in development cooperation on all continents and at all stages of development. The ILO today has a bigger portfolio than ever with some 700 active programs and projects in more than 100 countries with the support of 120 development partners. We'd like to hear more about the ILO's successful development approach and how these programs have helped support workers in local economies, perhaps some historical examples either abroad or even within the United States. Right. Thanks for that. Um, the, the ILO does not do development projects in the US. The US is a uh, advanced economy, uh, one of the, uh, the biggest in the world. Uh, I think still the biggest economy in the world today. Um, but we, we, do, we work with the US government in terms of how do, we, how do we improve development programs or development challenges in the field. So for example, you know, if we want to make sure that we continue to get, you know, cobalt or coal, uh, or coltane, these are rare earth elements that go into our technology, we have to make sure that those supply chains are there. We have to make sure that we have agreements uh, that protect the workers so that the predictability of supply is there. Um, so the work we do with the U.S. government is to identify these issues. So, for example, we are in discussion now. There is a big policy looking at labor migration issues, uh, particularly from the uh, what they call the Northern Triangle in Central America, where a lot of people, for lack of opportunity, because of poverty, because of social exclusion, uh, sometimes because of uh, um, uh, natural disasters caused by climate change, people are leaving uh, their home countries in search of a better opportunity. I mean, my uh, grandfather and grandmothers from both sides of my family came from Ireland to the United States. I was born in a little place called Brooklyn, New York. And uh, with that, uh, you know, the, the idea of coming to America and having an opportunity is a big draw. So, but how do we create economic opportunities for people in their home countries so they don't have to migrate? Because migration is not an easy thing to do. Sometimes it is the, uh, the husband leaving the family. Sometimes these are young women who are coming as domestic workers. Uh, my grandmothers were both uh, were indentured servants coming from Ireland, working in the US. Um, so with this, this is not an easy task to do. So how do we create economic opportunities for where people live to create e uh, economic growth and social protection for people in those areas? So that is one way we are working with the government of the US in order for that to happen. We've also worked on the issue of child labor. I mentioned that 20 years ago when we started working on child labor, there were 247 million. Uh, within the 20 years uh, since we started taking statistics, the number has gone down by 100 million. And it was Senator Harkin and Representative Engel for the Harkins-Engel Protocol, which was addressing chocolate in particular, uh, because there are a lot of uh, plantations in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, and Ghana, which are supplying you know, that wonderful coca seed that turns into that lovely chocolate that we love to have in the evening and uh, any time that we can. Um, but we have to make sure that the supply is there. We have to make sure that people are treated well. We have to make sure that um, that, that international supply chain doesn't have the corruption that, that uh, will create um, a sort of uh, hesitancy within the uh, access to those elements. So we have been working with the US government, particularly the Department of Labor, on addressing this issue, and largely because of the Harkin Engel Protocol and because of the International Labor Administration Bureau of the Department of Labor, we've been able to reduce those numbers, which has helped us here in this country as well too, to have access to these products. Um, we are working, for example, in the, uh, in the uh, Middle East. Uh, for example, in Syria, there are refugees who are leaving. Uh, mostly women and children who then go into third countries like Lebanon or like Jordan, overwhelming the existing populations in those countries um, and looking for jobs themselves and being decamped into these massive uh, sort of migration camps. Um, UNHCR, uh, the High Commissioner for Refugees, indicates that you know refugees stay in an encampment for seven to 15 years. I mean, I can't imagine living out of a tent for 17 to 15 years, seven to 15 years. Um, so how do we get people back to work? We can't just ignore the local population. So we'll work with the local Jordanians and the local uh, Lebanese, um, but also with the women and children who are coming. 
Um, how do we help them identify what their skills are? How do we help them get uh, um, uh, working papers? How do we ensure that we link the, uh, the talent with the employer? How do we ensure that there is childcare so the mother doesn't have to leave the child behind in a tent all day? How do we ensure that the woman is not harassed or attacked on her way to the factory as well too? So the ILO works with all these international organizations, our job mostly in the world of work, but the protection of the individual at the job and to and from that job. So this is where the social aspect of the ILO comes into play. The ILO also works, for example, I was in Banda Aceh just after the 2003 tsunami had struck, uh, which killed 200,000 people in this uh, area of, um, of Java in Indonesia. And I arrived when they were still, and I hate to say it, but bulldozing thousands, tens of thousands of bodies into mass graves because a wave came in that was 120 feet tall at over 200 miles an hour and it destroyed everything in its path. This natural disaster, no fault of the people who live there. They were living a very quiet existence in a tropical setting, beautiful. Anybody who has been to the Straits of Malacca between Malaysia and uh, Java will know that, th uh, they'll know that this was uh, Sumatra, will know that this is a gorgeous, gorgeous area. And when everything was devastated and people lost their families, they lost their homes, they lost their savings, they lost their credentials, we had to work with the international community to bring people back from the brink. How do you get people who have lost everything? If I lost my entire family, I think I would give up the will to live. But you can't just roll over and die. And people have a, 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 an absolute desire to, to get back from these things. So we worked on identifying where the skills were. We hired people to do these uh, projects and so. And not just come in with big road grading asphalting machines, which are on three days and off for four, but investing in people in sort of uh, appropriate technology, in building roads and building culverts and building bridges. And when you hire 10,000 people rather than one road grading machine, then you're investing in the economy. And then by them having money, the women who were in the villages were able to cook extra food and come to the work sites and sell that food to people, creating micro enterprise. And then young men with little motorcycles can come and then act as taxi services, thereby creating more economy as well. So the ILO looks at this from a very big perspective. And how do we get people from bad situations into situations of normalcy? And it's not the same as us. They're not looking to live in big, beautiful homes. They're not looking you know, to drive cars or have boats or have summer homes. They just want to make sure they're not living out in the open and starving and having just one meal a day for themselves. So that is the technical cooperation work the ILO does. And then leave you with one fact, the TC work, the technical cooperation the ILO does was actually pioneered by an American who is our director general. David Morris was the longest serving director general of the ILO. And he uh, brought to the ILO this idea that we should be working to help these countries, not just developing policy and technical advice for them, but how do we get down in the dirt and how do we work with them? And how do we ensure that you do more than just give them good advice? Because people that I have met around the world almost exclusively want to have a better life for themselves. That better life really depends on where they come from and what they can access for themselves. And like ourselves, they want their succeeding generation to do better than them. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time here today. For this next portion, we are going to pull the audience for future discussions with the ILO and then open it up to open Q&A. For this portion, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Kim. Kim, whenever you're ready. Hey, um, thanks so much, Kevin. That was very interesting information. Um, I actually have a couple of questions of my own, but we'll do the poll first and then go to open Q&A. We're just trying to get a sense of some of the topics that might be of interest to the group uh, for future conversations. Um, and the I questions for, for people viewing this recording after the fact, uh, the first choice of a future conversation with the ILO or your second choice and the options are gender pay gap, discrimination in the workplace, the gig economy, green jobs in the economy, and youth employment opportunities. Looks like green jobs in the economy is coming in first. That's a big issue, obviously. Great, I'm gonna go ahead and end polling. Okay, great, I will share results here. So it looks like green jobs in the economy is one of the uh, top 
choices for discussion, um, discrimination in the workplace also came in quite high. We did have a couple questions here in the chat, I think. Let me try and find those. Um, it was uh, kind of in reference to the pandemic again. Um, has the ILO started setting up any new partnerships to address labor policy changes that have come up as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, so the, the ILO has been working, for example, with the uh, World Health Organization, uh, which is responsible for looking at, uh, you know, pathogens uh, globally. Uh, and as you can imagine, um, you know, the, uh, the workplace is a place where we're very exposed, um, whether you're a frontline healthcare worker, whether you're a restaurant worker, um, you want to make sure that people are healthy. So the most important thing is to ensure the health of workers, because if a, health, if a worker is not healthy, the worker is not productive. Also, if a worker is sick, they, they can't uh, administer the services. I mean, just think about all the healthcare workers that fell ill and even died and succumbed to COVID-19. Um, and that's just this particular pathogen. Uh, there is no such thing as post-COVID-19. COVID-19 is now out there and this will always be with us. There will be new pathogens that will come on stream, which we'll have to deal with. So World Health Organization, looking at the health of workers, absolutely essential. We're also working with the World Bank. Um, we have a, a group called the International Inter Organization of Employers and the International Trade Union Confederation. And I was working with the World Bank, um, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and the International Finance Corporation, uh, negotiating with them about how are they investing in countries to ensure that you have these automatic stabilizers, that you have these social safety nets, right? Because if people fall into abject poverty, then you have, as I said, the economic spills into the social sphere, which then becomes a political crisis, right? Um, so we are working with them to ensure that the investments that they're making in countries and the World Bank is the lender uh, to countries so that they can build either infrastructure or systems to help their citizenry. So working with them to ensure that people had access to healthcare, access to education, access to the job market, uh, and opportunity uh, to, uh, to apply their skills, and maybe even encourage the government to provide to them what we call fiscal space so that they could give um, uh, income support. Because again, not everybody can telework. Uh, if you're a bus driver, if you are a surgeon, if you are a, uh, a police officer, a, fire, a fireman, if you are uh, an agricultural worker, you can't phone it in. You've got to be there on the ground. So you have to ensure that people have money to be able to afford the things that they had beforehand. We, as a very developed country in Western Europe, we could put that in place. Canada did that. They're supporting their, um, their unemployed workers up to 70% of their income for, I think it was nine months. I mean, that's a big investment and that creates deficits. But I think the option of not doing that creates even greater structural problems in the economy. So the ILO is working there, it's working at the UN with a, a constellation of agencies on peace and resilience. When, when certain societies are being ostracized or they are being excluded or they're being discriminated against or there is active warfare or there is climate change and disaster strikes, we have to ensure that we build resilience into these societies. Um, and when people have work and they, and they are earning money for themselves, they are least likely to go to war with one another. Um, there are many examples of this. Uh, Northern Ireland was, a, was an older example of that. But we're seeing that play out around the world, that people who are working, who have something to lose or something to gain, uh, will uh, become ex-combatants and get uh, engaged in the economy. And we work with the private sector. We work with um, individuals who are hiring people who are wanting to come back into the workforce. Um, and then lastly, to say we work with uh, UN Women and UNICEF to protect the children, uh, to make sure they have access to education, but also they're not exposed to these pathogens. In developed countries, how do we do uh, remote learning? Uh, but also in other countries, how do they have the PPEs to make sure that they can have outdoor schools? And in terms of women, I mean, I think that women are the biggest losers in COVID-19 because they have been the first ones who are out on jobs. So for example, um, they are working in a private household as a domestic worker, or they are working as a healthcare worker, uh, or they are uh, working as a teacher. I mean, they, because of the composition of the, the labor market, women were disproportionately impacted by this. And as I was saying earlier, a lot of women were also saying, why am I going out and working and pulling in, say, you know, 3,000, 4,000 a month 
when in fact childcare in the United States is about eight to 9,000 if you had to work a full-time job. So how can you possibly afford that? So it, there are disincentives, there are structural disincentives to that. And also women earn in the United States 77 cents on the dollar that a man earns. But if you go to the Middle East, it's 20 cents on the dollar. So we have these problems globally that we have to address. And the pandemic has laid bare how ill-prepared we are as a society to protect the most vulnerable among us. Thanks for that answer. And yes, um, we have seen that, you know, locally and globally that uh, so many people have been impacted because of COVID, um, you know, on a labor scale. Um, I, I did want to just question, you had mentioned that the ILO doesn't do any development work in the United States as a developed nation. Um, although the United States does not have health care for its citizens, um, which some might say would be a development opportunity uh, to ensure that Americans had access to health care that wasn't tied to their employment. Um, does the ILO have any thoughts on that or um, how folks who are interested in moving that forward, how they could get involved in this topic? So I'm smiling because you've put me uh, in a position of a political response. Um, look, I, I think the, uh, the issue is that, and, and again, I, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York myself, although, uh, you know, a progeny of, uh, of immigrants. Um, you know, we do have a lot of um, uh, problems in the United States. Uh, there are inequalities, there is discrimination uh, by gender, by race, by religion, by ethnic origin, by political persuasion. There are so many different aspects that we also face that many developing countries face as well too. Um, the, the US uh, again can uh, address these issues, but because of the federated sort of nature of it um, uh, or the state level uh, precedent, uh, sometimes you just can't have um, uh, national laws. I'll tell you an example where it did work. And, uh, and this is an example of how the ILO is connected to the US. Uh, during the Great Depression, uh, which actually COVID-19 was more destructive than the Great Depression, globally. It was more destructive than the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And in that time when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the president and uh, was a big supporter of the ILO, he called us the wild dream. Workers and employers sitting down together, talking about issues, how crazy of an idea that was. Um, but his, his uh, labor secretary, the first woman labor secretary, Frances Perkins, was a representative of the US to the ILO. And during 1934 conference, she learned about this interesting idea called social security and brought that back to the US, discussed that within Congress. And then after four years, it was passed into law. And many of your grandparents, your parents, and maybe even yourselves, if the system holds, because it's not very well capitalized right now, but social security is your lifeline when you retire. For most people, that's all they have because they don't have pensions, they don't have 401k. And that is a whole cloth idea of the ILO that was instituted and brought into the United States. So yes, the ILO has had an influence through its knowledge, through its policies, through its analysis, through its research, right? I mean, back uh, when the ILO had started, the, the US was not a member of the ILO. Our first conference was held in Washington, D.C. in the Organization of American States Headquarters Building at the time called the Pan American U uh, Union Building down on 17th and Constitution Avenue. And the, the presiding of that, the president of that was the Secretary of State and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the Assistant uh, Secretary of the Navy, provided all the logistical support. Um, so the ILO has had such a wonderful uh, link to the United States but there is a resistance to say, well, those are socialist ideas. Those are European ideas. Those are you know, Asian values, they're not ours. Um, but I think the reality is when you start looking at the economics of this, you start looking at the social structure, the social justice issues, when you start looking at what decent work actually means, we can learn a lot from different countries. In Brazil, what they have to eliminate child labor, they put in something called Bolsa Familia, and this was a cash, a conditional cash transfer program that allowed kids to go to school and the government would pay, uh, replace the income the children would bring into the household to the parent. And the obligation was that the child would go to school. What a great program that was. So the family did not lose. 
you then had a more productive member of society and you were getting rid of child labor. Now, those policies have been reversed and we are now not back to square one, but it just shows you sometimes that, you know, these issues should not be political footballs. These are policy issues that help us improve the quality of our lives, regardless of where we live. And we are in a globalized environment. Everything that you are wearing, touching, sitting on, eating, uh, looking at, using, that comes from someplace else. You cannot be a global power without having a global reach. And that means you have to engage in the multilateral system. Sorry for the soapbox. No, that's great. Thank you. And sorry for putting you on the, on the political oh. spot, um, but a great <laughs> answer. And um, definitely uh, we do live in a global society and learning and sharing ideas that can help everyone across the board is definitely something that we, with our jobs, we do that every day and appreciate that the ILO is doing that as well. Um, I know we're running out of time here. There were a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to kind of skip ahead to one from Emmy on, um, on the concern over decreasing birth rates in the United States. And it's been credited to working conditions um, and cost of living. Um, is the ILO concerned about birth rate issues? for future workforces? Um, I mean, in a securitist sort of way. So let me, there, there is an organization in the UN called the UN Fund for Population Activities, uh, which is very active globally. Um, the ILO looks at this as a future workforce, right? So we're looking at demographics. So in the future of work, one of the big mega drivers of change, technology being one, climate change being another, pathogens being another, but demographics are driving a lot, right? So where is the youngest population? The youngest population is Afri actually in Africa, right? So with digital technology, African countries may be able to leapfrog a lot of Western European countries and actually be more economically productive, right? But if we set things up like a pay-as-you-go system like social security, social security depends upon new workers coming into the system, paying their social security taxes, and then that gives grandma and grandpa some money to live on so they're, you know, they, they will have a quality life and not move back in with the sons and daughters. And then maybe you as young students have to look after grandma twice a week or whatever it might be, right? So we want people to be independent. But if you don't have people paying into a system, that social security account goes down and there is no money to pay people to pay for the people who have already retired. That's the downside. You also don't have new entrants into the labor market. You know, Japan for many years has been stagnant. I mean, that could be our future where the birth rate there is below the replacement level, right? So once you start having a decreasing population, you have less people who are going into the workforce who are coming up with new ideas, who are developing new economy for themselves. Um, it's an aging society. Aging societies have lots of healthcare costs and, and concerns with that. So you start to have multiplicity of all these problems and countries with younger generations or younger people going in with access to education, access to opportunity, they're the countries that will strive and survive. So we're not saying have more kids, that's not what our policy suggestion is, but it is to say that demographics is very, very important. Also in education, and we find this in Italy and other countries like that, where women who are going to school then are not only going for their undergraduate, their graduate and their PhD, by the time they come out, of those programs, they're 38, they're 39 years old, maybe they are deciding to have a career rather than to have families. So the whole concept of what a society means is changing. How do you change that? Through immigration, right? The population in the United States grows through immigration. It was in Asia, then it was Africa. I mean, so you have these demographic changes all the time. And when you have restrictive policies and you don't have new people coming into your, into your country and then becoming citizens and then contributing to society, you're not growing as well too. So that was the boom of the United States for so many decades because we had new ideas. We had new people. We had people coming in who wanted a better life for themselves. They were working harder. And so, um, so it really creates a conundrum. So you know, population rates is one data set, a data point. Don't just look at that, but look how the society is looking after those people who are already here and protecting that through education access, through health access, through better quality of life for themselves. So, and, and this is just the US, just imagine what it's like in Rwanda, just imagine what it's like in, uh, in China, just imagine what it's like in 
in uh, Samoa or uh, the Marshall Islands or in uh, uh, in uh, uh, Paraguay. I mean, so many different countries having so many different structural issues. So we look at all those policies. What are the best ones? And we show that, we, we give that. So our development work is knowledge sharing. That's what the ILO brings to the United States, sharing the knowledge of policies and what works and hopefully to replicate the best policies and move the country forward, just like any other country in the world. Great, thanks for that. And I love that knowledge sharing because that is so important. Um, and we are at time. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Kevin, so much for this time and sharing all of this insight and um, all of these, the great information about the work that ILO is doing. Um, we look forward to future conversations with you, uh, maybe diving in to some of the other uh, topics of interest and uh, policy work there. Um, potentially how people here in California can get more involved in this sort of work. Um, if there are any opportunities, we would love to share with our audience. So thank you again for being here. Thanks to the participants for, uh, for being here with us today. And uh, we look forward to future discussions.